Okay. Um, so we uh, finished yesterday on the object-oriented features of Golang. Um, we tried to see some polymorphic behaviors uh, using interfaces and structs. Uh, we will redo it a little bit today because I want to get this kind of uh, point across uh, that you can do object-oriented kind of designs and programming using Golang. Uh, so let's do a quick um, um, quick kind of design of a system which involves having a concept of people, um, students and teachers, okay? So in a normal, um, normal setup, you would have three concepts. Um, so you would have a concept of a person, a concept of a student, and a teacher, okay? And the person has a name, um, say an age, a student is the same, a student is a person, but it has a student ID, and then the teacher is also a person, but it has an employee ID, okay? To simplify things, we can basically say, you know, he, you know, there is a concept of somebody with ID, okay? So we say student and teacher both have IDs, okay? How would you design it with, uh, with C++? What would you do? How would your class hierarchy look like? Yeah? You take the person class. Yeah. And you can make, uh, uh, what do you call that one? Uh, subclass. Yeah. Uh, teacher. Okay. And again, you make subclass student. Okay. So, so person class, which has two subclasses. Yep. Sounds good. <coughs> So we would have a person, which would have two attributes, name and age, and then you would have two subclasses, one being a student, one being a teacher, and these would have an ID. Correct? So what limitations this design has? Can I have an instance, can I have an object which is a student? Yes, I, ha I can. Can I have, it, this is an abstract class or is it a concrete class? It depends. If it's an abstract class, I cannot have a person, right? If this one is an abstract class, I can only have students and teachers. If this one is not abstract, I can instantiate a person as well. So I can have, you know, I can say P is a person. Right? Okay. Can I have a person who is a student? Yes, I can because every student is a person. Uh, can I have a student who is also a teacher? No, I can't, right? Uh, so I cannot have uh, a teacher who is also a student. Okay. And we, we don't duplicate. Um, we don't duplicate the fields because we have the inheritance, so that's nice. Uh, can I have a person who is student in one university and in the other? So a single person is a student twice and has two different IDs, student IDs. Not with this data structure, if we were to add something called university, then no. Yeah, exactly. So with this, I cannot be Marius, person Marius, who is signed up in two universities and have two different IDs, right? Okay, so that's fine. So we can kind of design, how would we go around it? So let's say we do have a requirement that we actually need to have ability to do that. How would we do that? How would you, yeah? Yes, you, you could uh, you could turn that into an array, but it, it feels an overkill. Like, you know, a person signing up for two universities is more of an exception than the rule. So majority of students are just single IDs, and then you have to operate on the array, right? 
Uh, so yes, that would work, but that feels a little bit dirty and a, a little bit of a hack. So how? What? What are the possible solutions we look at? Yeah. You have a, a new a, a table outside which keeps track of which students belongs to which university. Like a many, many, few, many. Yeah. Yeah, you, you could, but so this boils down. So the first solution is the array or the IDs. The second solution is what you're saying is I have person one, um, which is Mariusz. Um, so it's, I, I have name Mariusz, whatever. So I'm, I'm me. And now I'm, I'm saying there is one student who is um, new student and it has the name Marius, age, whatever, and student ID, whatever. And there is a second student who also is Marius with the same age. It's kind of the same person, but a different ID. So then I have two students, which kind of point to the same. So let's say person also has like the, um, the you know, personal, personal ID. It's like a, you know, futsal number, right? So then I have two students who have different student IDs, but they point to the same person. But I have to duplicate the person data twice, because I have to say, OK, that name, age, and per, you know, futsal number for this student is the same as for this student, right? How would I go about fixing that so I don't duplicate this? So if I have the second student, I don't duplicate, yeah? Say again? Exactly. What an object oriented terminology, how would we call it? Um, yeah, uh, I'm just looking at an example. So you can pretty much like type person, pointer uh, sign, and then person again. Yeah, exactly. So what we could do is we have. So we are using student. We are instantiating student uh, with the ID of the student. So ID one, ID two, two different universities, two different IDs. But the two students are using the same person, right? So in a sense, what we could do is we could say uh, actually a student doesn't inherit from a person. There is a person, you know link so a student is a person by delegation instead of by inheritance right so if we delegate the properties of a person to a student then we say okay i can now say a new person marius with whatever so i have i have m being myself and now i can say marius is student in this university and also marius is a student in that university, and I don't duplicate. And now if I change properties of Marius, so Marius age changed, then it changes in all those references, right? So instead of doing inheritance, I'm doing delegation, right? What are the uh, negative things of using delegation instead of inheritance? Uh, the student ID, what about the inheritance? Student ID? Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. For a given university, you can only have one. Yeah, yeah. But what are the side effects of me changing that? So I, teacher is still using inheritance, and student is using delegation. What changed? Yeah. Uh, you can, if you, for example, have a list or an array, you can't put the two students in that array, probably. And you can't put it in the same uh, list or array as the person and teacher. Exactly. So the type changed, right? So before, every student was also a person. And now a student is not a person anymore because I just broke the inheritance. So my type information changed. So every teacher is a person, but a student is just a student. The student is not a person anymore in the C++ way of doing the type inheritance. Correct? OK. <laughs> so, in Go, we don't have inheritance at all, actually, so we have to use delegation, right? So in Go, what we would do, we would say, well, I have a person which has name, age, and uh, futsal number. I have a teacher. 
uh, which has a link to a person by delegation. And I have a student uh, who has the link to a person by delegation. And I lost this kind of uh, nice way of saying that uh, that a student is a person in a sense, okay? So if I have a struct, if I say struct person with those three fields, and if I said struct student and struct teacher, they, those are all three different types and I cannot pass them as if they were interchangeable, as you would do in the object-oriented way, right? Uh, so if I have some sort of a processor which takes people, I cannot pass students to it because student is not a person. So the way around it is to use interfaces, okay? So in fact, I don't need to have um, a person being a struct. I can say a person is anything, anything that has an interface which provides me three methods, a name, an age, and a personal number. Anything that provides me those three things is a person, and it becomes an interface, okay? So now a person is an interface, and the, uh, the link between these two is either by having an extra structure which will fill, it, fill in those fields, because I kind of need the th three fields now, right? Or I can say, well, you know, because we kind of doing it this way, um, I can have a struct which has the, the, the three fields here and the three fields here, and there is an implementation that the student implements the person methods and the teacher implements the person methods, and now those two structs become a person because they do implement the interface for me. So if I have a method, so what, what we want is we want something like this. I want to be able to have a student, S, uh, so student S is a student, and I have person, um, and I have a teacher T, which is uh, a teacher. And now I want to have some sort of a processor. I, I want to have, let's say, process, and I want to be able to pass S and T. And to, to have a method called process, I would have to define it as func, func process, and the, the object it takes is of type person, right? So now any person can be passed here, and it will provide me those three things, and then I can pass a student or a teacher to it. Does it make sense? Yeah? It's completely implicit. Yes, it's completely implicit. However, I cannot, insta I don't have, like with this design, with those two structs and the interface, I cannot have a P and say, P is a person, person Marius, right? I would have to actually have a third struct, which is a person. If I have a requirement to be able to instantiate a person who is neither a student or teacher, Right? So it depends on the requirements. If the requirements are you have to be able to instantiate a person, teachers, and students, then I need a third struct, which I would probably do then use those three fields here and have a link to a person in those two structs so I don't duplicate the structs. I can nest structs in Go. Like in, in any language, you can nest structs. So I can have a <laughs> struct inside a struct. Uh, and then this would become a struct, and then interface and the struct cannot have the same name for a type, right? So interfaces usually are um, either you, you add ed, air, or able to the interfaces, right? Uh, name, so you would say personable or something, right? And then you would have the interface which provides you those three methods, yeah? How about adding a big? 
Yeah, so that's another convention. Like C sharp uses the big I con or uh, C++ as well. They usually add a, a big I in the interfaces. With Go, uh, the convention is to use a suffix instead of prefix. Mm -hmm. So typically, if you see um, type with this one of those suffixes, that's usually an interface. Um, so that you know that that's just a, a way of agreeing with your team. So if your team agrees to have interfaces with capital I, that's fine. But the community in general, they they follow this, right? Um, so, but if we only instantiate students and teachers, then I don't need to have that, and then I don't need that extra struct, and I can have a person type and um, the two structs which would have the extra extra fields, the the extra three fields, and then the type checks are implicit, as you pointed out. Make sense? Questions about this? So you can kind of do and normal object-oriented designs using structs, interfaces, and methods, but you don't have inheritance, so you're mostly operating with systems by delegation. And by delegation, um, you kind of get a little bit extra flexibility, because as, as we've seen with the inher inheritance, if you design your inheritance the original way, and the requirements change, and now you say, well, by the way, you can be students in two places, it's really hard to adapt it, to change it. With delegation, it's much easier to fiddle around and move you know, things around and still confirm to the interface and change somewhat your implementation and make the system adapt to, to change requirements a little bit easier. OK? Good. So that was the, uh, the part which we started yesterday and kind of uh, got sidetracked, yeah? It's a big letter on methods first. Is it mandatory? OK, so big letter. Um, that's a good question. Those of you who did tutorial, do you know the answer? Yeah? Right, so how do you, um, uh, yeah, you don't know C, right? Actually, so, yeah. so public versus Exactly. So the capital letter means that if someone is using your module from outside, they see everything that you named with capital letters. Everything that you named with small letters are not visible from outside your module. So if you have a, you know, a, a package and a, a text file where you have your classes, I mean your structs and your functions, all the functions which are small letter, which start with small letter, are only visible within that scope. Nothing is visible outside. So if someone is using your module, um, then they will not see anything which is small letter. Everything that you named with the capital letter is visible, right? That includes the, that is a little bit um, uh, getting used to. So if I named my type person with capital P and somebody is using it, they will see the type person, but because I named the name, age, and PID with small letters, they will not see the inside fields, right, at all. They will only see the type with nothing in it. Uh, so if I want them to see uh, those three things, I have to say name, <coughs> age, and personal ID, all capitals as well. So then they will see them, okay? So if you have some data structures or some functions which are private to you, just use small letter. If you want something exposed, like a public API to people using your module from outside, then you just um, use the capitals. OK. So yeah, that kind of goes, uh, we will not repeat it. It, it, it uses similar uh, example using a geometry, uh, which is the interface, and then the area, which is the method, which allows you to have rectangles and circles. And then I can have print area method, which can take you know a rectangle or circle, right? So it's the same, but with the geometric figures instead of student and teachers. Um, so the example is there. Right. So now we get a little bit away from object-oriented programming, and we look into functional programming. So I told you about this yesterday. Um, that Go has much more functional feel than other languages, and it's not in, that, in, in a sense of powerfulness. Like, 
You can express the same things using Java or C++ and so on. They are as expressive as each other, but the syntax makes it that people use those features or not. So the syntax with um, C++ and function pointers is a little bit complicated, so people tend not to use it that much. Whereas with Go, the syntax kind of reads easy enough that you can make complicated second order functions uh, and it will kind of work relatively fine. So there is a homework for those of you who, uh, who like homeworks. Uh, write a function that, that takes zero arguments uh, and returns another function that takes two arguments of type int and returns the sum of those parameters, right? Um, so that's relatively straightforward. Um, okay, do you know how would you do that in C++? No, because you didn't have function pointers, right? Um, so, okay, so forget about the C++ part. How would you do it in Go? Uh, maybe I write it on in the editor. So let's say, uh, let's, let's use this one. So we have to, um, we have to write a function which returns another function. Um, so let me just delete that. So we need a, a function which will return another function. So let's say we have a function f which will return another function. So how would you specify that? Well, you would say, well, function f takes no arguments, so it, it takes zero arguments, and returns a function which takes two parameters, which are int and int, and that second function returns an int, which is the sum of the two ints which I pass, right? <coughs> uh, so function f takes no arguments, the arguments are inside here, and returns a function which takes two parameters, which returns an int, okay? It looks kind of awkward, but believe me, if you write that line in C++, it would look horrible, much more awful, right? Uh, if you try to express that. So then what you need to do is you have to say, well, return a function which takes a, which is an int, b, which is an int, and it turns an int as a parameter, and this function basically says, Okay, return a plus b, okay? So now I can say a is a result of f, and I can say, um, um, format print line and I can say uh, a 10 20 does it make sense to you that now a became a function which was the result of calling f and what f did f returned another function so now a is a function which takes two parameters so I can call a with those two parameters and get the sum Okay, does it, is it understood? So the second part of the, of the question was, do that inline as anonymous function. What is an anonymous function? Well, anonymous function is the function which doesn't have a name. So if I were to do that uh, without the F, I would have to basically paste from this point here, to that bracket, oh, actually to that bracket, from this point to this point here, and it would work exactly the same way in Go. In C++, you would have to use a lambda notation. That you didn't have lambda functions in your course. Okay, so, but then you kind of would need to understand that, the, that this looks a little bit complex, but it actually is not like once you read it once or twice, it kind of reads okay. It says, okay, there is a function f which returns this. 
Uh, and this is a function which takes two arguments and returns this. It, 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 it is relatively straightforward. All right, so anyway, we will do that. Uh, we will do that later where we uh, specify a function decorators. So there is a pattern in object-oriented programming where you have kind of a, a particular data structure with particular methods. And now you want to extend it by extra functionality. Okay. So imagine that you have um, that you have a particular uh, system where uh, let's say let's say you have uh, you have some sort of a network process. Uh, that you uh, that you're doing something with the network. Okay, you're opening a connection. You're getting some data structure back from a network. So you're doing something with the with the network, and it's a function which takes a particular parameter. Let's say we have something which is called context. Okay, so we have something C which is uh, which is called context that this function takes. And then in your program, you like write your code. And then at some point, you're saying uh, net process. And then you're passing, you know, you have, you, you got like uh, C1, which is your context. So you're passing C1 here. And then you, you're carrying on with your processing, right? So you're actually doing something at this point in your logic of, of the code. And this one is some, you, you're obtaining the context from somewhere. OK? So now. Um, the requirements change, and you say, actually, I want to log this. I want to log every time this happens um, that um, I have a trace of when I was doing this network processing. Okay? So you have like one requirement which says add <coughs> logging. You can have another requirement which says, ah, oh, yeah, by the way, it would be really nice if we have an ability to um, turn on and off uh, timing. I want to know how long it took, like how, how slow or fast I was in responding to this network uh, request. So maybe some uh, instrumentation, some timing information I want to get, right? So how would you do that in object-oriented fashion? Well, you would have some sort of a class, which is your, which would be some sort of type. You would have some type here. Uh, let's call it network process NP. And this class uh, would um, have a particular signatures here of what it's, it's doing inside. And then what you would do is you would have kind of NP with logging class, which inherits from this class, but adds logging to the logic, right? And then you might decide, okay, I actually need also NP with uh, timing information. So I have another class which extends, again, extends this basic NP class, but all confirm to NP. And here you would say, um, you would say parameter P uh, do the job, do job. And on the entry, where wherever whatever function or method it is, let's say you, you're doing some sort of a function f, you would pass, uh, I will use the, the go syntax here, you would pass p, which would be np. Okay? So then, whatever you're doing here, you're passing p, which is np. The np has the, the do job method. Um, so it, it's doing it, but if you want the logging, you would pass the instance of NP with logging. If you want this to be with timing, you would pass an instance of NP with timing. Okay? What if you want logging and timing at the same time? It's like, oh, okay. Then you have to, it's like, okay, uh, nah, what should I do, right? Uh, you have to have another type, which is NP with logging and with timing. Right? And then you would instantiate it, pass it here, and then you would have logging and timing. So with object-oriented design, it feels a little bit awkward that you want to mix and match the behaviors. Right? There is no really easy way of doing it. Uh, so one way of doing it is 
you have this kind of a type inheritance, or you use a decorator pattern where you can add decorations to the base type, right? So then if you don't want to use the, the hierarchy, instead what would you do is you would do, you would make this an interface, you would make the logic a kind of a base class, and you would have a decorators, which are instances of logging, timing, and you would kind of say, add this decoration to the base class, right? Have you used uh, some patterns like that? It's, yeah, may, maybe not, but that, that's the way you would kind of solve it in the, in the object-oriented way, using a decorator. Decorator. So if you Google all patterns and say decorator, then it's kind of the solution to, to this problem. With functional programming, with the ones that we have here, uh, you, you don't need any of that because what happens is you basically can have a function. So if I have a function which, uh, I have a function f, like the, the one which becomes <coughs> this, with two parameters, int and int, and it returns an int, right? If I have a type like this, so I, I have type t. So if I have another function which takes t of type t, I can pass to f, um, you know, let's say g. I can pass to g f, but I can pass to g anything that takes two integers and returns an integer, okay? So now it's very trivial for me to pass to g, so like in this case, it's, it's, it's p that we're passing, right? So if I have this sequence and I'm expecting p of being a, of particular type, and this type basically means that np is a function which takes a particular parameters and returns a particular type, then I can take my normal uh, networking, so if I have a net process, the original one, uh, which was taking the parameter and returning the return type, I can take this and I can inline create a new function which is anonymous with no name, which uh, takes p and returns r, and it does whatever I need, like logging or timing, and then calls net process and passes p to net process. So I can encapsulate this inside another function and pass this pointer to here at will. Right? So I don't need to use any kind of a hierarchy or any pattern or anything, it, it just works out of the box, this kind of encapsulation of behavior, of particular behavior, and then I can add log how long it took to do this, or put, put it into the logger that I actually call this, and so on. And you can dynamically do that. I, um, is it clear? Who kind of conceptually understands this? Is, is it okay? It is related to this, but it's kind of in a more uh, complicated use cases. Okay, all right. Let's let's move on. We will uh, we will come back to it later on, and we can discuss it. Um, we can discuss it with um, with people as you will need to to develop your your systems. Okay, so. The next big one is concurrency, but let's let's do that after the break, but let's do one more thing before the break. So how many of you know what is JSON? So what is JSON? Yeah? Okay, what type of data structure? Okay, and what is JSON stands for? What's the actual uh, acronym? No idea. Who knows? Yeah? JavaScript object notation. Yes. Okay, so um, it originated as a textual representation of objects from JavaScript. JavaScript is uh, a complex programming language which has a notion of objects and they kind of look like structs, nested structs. 
um, and it is um, similar to so I will just delete the, this yeah let's let me open a new file so if I were to if I were to uh, write um, if, if I was in JavaScript, who, who of you know JavaScript? Most of you? So if I were to write an object O in JavaScript, which has uh, a properties name, age, and uh, futsal number, right? I would say O is an object which has a property called name, which is Marius and it has the property of age which is uh, whatever and the property of personal ID which is whatever right I would do that and say semicolon and now I can say o.name and it would be Marius right so this notation which I just did is kind of a JavaScript notation for specifying structs right um, I could also say there is another object P which is of type struct or object and it has a property person which is of which is O right so now I have nested um, I have a nested uh, structure so I can say now P dot person dot name does it make sense I just have nesting now if I rename this to be P then the property of P is actually P right okay so they formalized it and they said okay let's standardize it and they say the proper JSON actually you have to use text here as well so you cannot just say name like I did you have to say key value pairs and the key is also enclosed in quotes um, then you do that for H but you don't have to do it for numbers you have to do it for property type you don't do it I mean you do it for string by default and then if I say married then I could say true okay and if I do this if I delete that um, I effectively have a very simple JSON structure which um, then uh, provides me with the four fields name, age, Pete and merit and it has the values what, what do we use JSON for? yeah? Correct. So we often use it for uh, as a medium to communicate uh, objects between backend and front end or just to get data from the websites. Right. We can use it for RSS feeds. We can use it for responses from of the services. Uh, so I can go, uh, for example, to GitHub and. Uh, what was it? Uh, was it Appy? And oh, off you I go. Like I, I went to a website and what I get back? Look, it's JSON. <laughs> right? It has the enclosing curly braces, it has a number of properties and a number of <laughs> uh, values. It's a key value kind of struct, right? So I have a current user URL. Okay. You know, I have some properties user URL, um, repositories. Okay, look, there is a user repositories URL. What if I copy that, right? And I paste it here, and it had, um, do you see it? It has a user as a ne next one, and then repos. My um, query requires requires a user and then repos anyone wants to give me a user handle on github 
Huh? Henrik T R E. Okay, let's check. You don't have any repos, or did I misspell your? Um, Le yeah, let's say my one. Oh, I'm there. So there is an ID of the repository, the name, full full name of the repository. There is one, there is another one, bips, there is another one, block, and so on and so forth, right? Okay, um, so as we see, JSON is kind of useful for... Re okay, so that's why your array was empty, right? So if I, uh, if I reopen it, um, notice one, one more thing. So the whole thing is in a closed in square brackets, right? So the square brackets is a notation for array. So it means um, you have the structs, which are the objects inside an array, and they are co uh, comma separated. So this one finishes here, and then the next one starts, and I have a number of those entries put inside the array, right? So I have primitive types, I have numbers, I have, as, as I showed you, the uh, the the keys. Um, numbers don't have to be enclosed in, uh, in quotes. The quotes mean it's a string. False and true are boolean. You don't enclose them. Uh, there is another type which is uh, sometimes used. It's not used here. Um, so let's, let's do something else. Let's say uh, events. Okay, so if I take this repo and I say events, Hopefully, I will be able to show you this extra type that uh, there was. There were no events about bips, but how about? Um, yeah, that there were the events one is a little bit tricky. Like, okay, let's do this. Let's do go lang. Let's go go. So, this is the Go programming language repo. Okay, and then. We have events, uh, and one of the yeah, so one of the fields is this text, and as you see, it looks like a date with time, and it's formatted spe special way. It's an ISO standard for specifying dates, and JavaScript is using it, so the JSON notation is using it to convey date information. So you ha you can uh, use timestamps or dates in a particular formatted way, and then the JSON parser will read and write appropriately the, the, the date time format. Uh, sometimes we don't use that, sometimes we use the Unix, Unix timestamp instead, and it's basically like a long int, it's like a long integer. Uh, but if you want to be more verbose, you can use the time like this one. All right, so let's have a short break. We start again at 10 past 12. Uh, and we talk a little bit about concurrency. Yeah. All right. So, how many of you are using Blackboard? Those of you who don't use Blackboard, you have to start using it. We don't like it too much, but that's the you know, uh, environment of choice for MTNU, and we have to all be using it. Um, so, uh, so press the button from the from behind. All right. So on the blackboard, if you go to the blackboard, there is a kind of a left panel which shows um, shows you some of the course information. Uh, we try to keep uh, the course related information in the coursework. You have a week-by-week -week lecture material there and the recordings. And there is a new one which popped up um, yesterday. Yay! So it's an assignment. You will have to do three assignments for this course. Uh, the first assignment is the one which is submitted. Uh, the next one will be defined a little bit later. And the final assignment will be a small project that you will do in groups. So the first two assignments are individual. 
this the third assignment is a group mini project small project okay so i will talk about the third one first so the mini project is you group yourself into three or four people and you think of what is that you would like to do and you will pitch a small paragraph of what is it that you will do yourself you choose your scope yourself and then you do it it has to be related to cloud computing you will have to do some deployment and some service uh, but the choice of what you want to consume and what you want to produce is up to the group okay uh, if the scope is too big we will tell you no it's too ambitious you have to do something smaller if the scope is too small we will tell you well it's not enough to get 20 points so you, we have to allocate 40 points for those three assignments the first 10 the first one is worth 10 the second is 10 the final one is 20 okay so you can start thinking of what is it that you would like to do for the project and we try to make both assignments the first two assignments designed in such a way that you can reuse as much as possible for the project okay so the first two assignments are giving you building blocks to make your project easier um, Right, so what is the first assignment about? Um, let's, let's make it a little bit bigger. <coughs> Develop a service that will consume a given GitHub project URI and will return the associated user account organization, an indication of programming language is used for that project and the account name of the top committer, that is the contributor with the largest number of commits to the project. You will use the API that we just explored. You will use those calls to the GitHub API to get those JSON structures. And then you will be able to extract the necessary information. You, ha you have to extract four pieces of information. Uh, one is the owner of the project. It is actually part of the, the owner of the project is part of the URL. So you can extract it out of the URL or you can extract it from the JSON, uh, whichever is easier. Um, the, the project name is also part of the URL. So the two pieces are kind of given. Then you have to extract who is the committer, who is the top committer in the project. That is a little bit of work because the information is not directly given. It is given as a list of all, all com uh, contributors to the project. You have to get all of them out and sort them according to the number of commits they've done. Uh, so you have to do a little bit of processing of the JSON uh, based on the JSON data that you will get. And then you will also make a request. Um, so you typically will do two or three requests to the uh, GitHub API to get all those information out of it. So this is what we expect out of the service to come back for a given URL that we will give to the service. And the service will be deployed on Heroku or Google Cloud, and you will submit the URL to your public service. And then the automated system will test it and then give you the points or not. OK, we will try to automate it so we don't have to mark you, that the computer will mark you. OK? Um, the assignment will be is worth 10 percent, so ten points. Uh, it's individual work, but of course you can uh, work with others. You know, learn from each other. Um, you can use code snippets from sources like um, Stack Overflow or some tutorials. That's okay, but you have to attribute where you got the code. If you wrote the code yourself, that's fine. You don't need to attribute. But if you reused code from a tutorial or from a web just put a URL and say uh, this this code was taken from uh, stack overflow questions such and such and just put a URL okay in, in your source code uh, that's okay you have to understand how the code works right um, because if you don't then you don't really learn uh, to use it but you can copy and paste s s uh, snippets of code if you find something useful um, Okay, and the due date is 21st of September. Any questions about the assignment one? That is the simplest assignment. The assignment two will be a little bit more than this one. And then the final project is up to you. Um, but you can start thinking 
of the projects that you would like to do. We actually have to do this ourselves because we have to check if your service works. So we have to write, you know, a representative service which does exactly the same thing. So we will uh, see how long it takes to do it. We haven't done it yet. Um, so yeah, that's that's the state of affairs regarding the assignments. So any questions? All right, you may have questions later on of how to do certain things, uh, post them on Blackboard. So anything you have questions about which relate to the assignment or to the programming or to the use of APIs of how to find things, uh, post them on the Blackboard, on the discussion boards, and then if some of you know the answer, just answer it, okay? Uh, we want you to kind of uh, discuss things among them yourself as much as possible. Uh, we will obviously chip in as well. Um, where to find this? Well, you, if you go to, I believe, developer, developer, then you will see the um, GitHub API. Um, Maybe this one. Yeah, so you have the various schemas and various um, references of where things are. So for example, yeah, you can use the uh, the one which I was showing before. So you can ask for all the repos, or you can ask for a repos of a particular user. So we've already tried those. Um, or you can use for a particular repo um, as well. So you can... And they have kind of an example of what is being returned. So you can, yeah, so for example, this one. I can get a snippet for a particular repo of a particular user, right? So I can say um, HTTP API GitHub, and then you say, oops. You say repos, owner, repo. So I can say, I've already forgot, repos. So I can say repos, golang, go, and I will get an information about the go programming language project, right? So this is the, um, this is the URL that you will, like if you say, GitHub So here I have um, the generic GitHub and then if I say Golang the organization and the project I'm in the go project for golang organization right so i am on that page so this is the url that you have to pass to the service to get the assignment done and then if i know the if i know this i can do this i can get this information as a json file so i know what's the name of the project i know the full name of the project i know who the owner is it's golang is the owner uh, and I have extra information, but it's uh, irrelevant. You only need to extract the name of the project and the Golang, the, which is the owner. And then here, there is a URL which says languages. Um, so language of the project is Go, but there is an extra... Um, uh, let me say... Language which is here. 
there is a URL here which says if I ask for that I get a list of all the languages used in the Golang project and that's the array you want to get right so Go is that many bytes, assembly, that many HTML, C, and so on. So those are all languages used for the Golang project. And it has the, it, as you see, it's basically the same pattern as before, plus languages at the end. So it's the same as what we did here, but if I add slash languages, I will get the language list. It's relatively trivial. So, um, one hint, there are limiters of how many requests can you do to GitHub, okay? So when you will be developing your application, you will have to test how, how you request and get data. And at some point, if you test it too much, the GitHub will, will block you for an hour and you cannot query them anymore or it can block you for six hours, okay? So the way to go around it is you do this query manually, like I did. You copy that JSON yourself, copy it and paste it into your code. And then instead of doing a real HTTP request to get the JSON back, you fake it by doing the, the string that you already have. And then you test it with the fake data. So if it works with the fake data, it has to work with the real query as well, right? I mean, most of the time, unless your network is not working and so on, you may have some other issues that it may not work, but at least you know that once you get the data, it works, right? And that will be the majority of your time spent, that it actually parses the JSON correctly and you're extracting the data correctly and so on and so forth. So do this, copy that and paste it into your code. Uh, do this, copy it again, copy the whole JSON thing, paste it into your code and fake your requests in such a way that when you are testing your application, you're not making a really request to the network, you're using the fake data. And you can do it for a couple of repos. You can do it for Go, which I just did, and for another repo, and for another repo, right? So you have like three use test cases that you can test your app against, and if it passes, then you can start testing it with the real networking, with the real system. All right. Any questions so far? Is the assignment okay? You feel it's challenging? Who feels the assignment is challenging? Okay, who feels it's easy? Okay, you will see how it goes. Um, okay, so let's move on to the fun part. So concurrency. Um, you haven't had concurrent or thre multi-threaded programming at all, right? Do you know what threads are? Yeah? But, what, can you explain? Uh, a process can consist of multiple threads doing things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, so, um, if you have a single program, uh, it is usually encapsulated in a process. So operating system, are you having operating systems right now? Next semester. All right, so I will not dive into operating systems, but operating systems are kind of uh, a layer of software which manages programs. And the programs are usually separated into processes individually. So every program is given a process to, to manage and to run inside. And that's how you have multiple applications running at the same time on, on your machine, v very simplistically speaking, okay? But within that process, you can have also, you may want also to have concurrent behaviors, like you want to show user something, but a user is pressing a key at the same time and you want to be processing events, you want to be downloading something from the network, you want to be displaying the UI, you want to be animating, pressing of the buttons, so you want to have you know, concurrent behavior in your application as well. And we do that by having threads. Threads are lightweight processes which r run within a single bigger, fatter process, okay? So operating system needs to allocate memory and do a certain provisioning of the IO and so on to create this kind of 
process for you, for the application. And then once it's done, the threads, the multi-threaded kind of uh, chunks which are running within your process are a little bit more lightweight. Operating system is not doing as much work for that, right? So again, it's, it's very simplistically speaking, you will learn more about it in the operating systems. So if we have a way to write programs which can do concurrent things at the same time, then we need to have some sort of a mechanism to achieve that. And the mechanism is usually based on, on threads, okay? Uh, so in C++ and in C and in many other languages, we have a concept of a thread. Uh, and what it means is we have, um, we have a main program. So if, if I call main in C++, I start executing a sequence of instructions which are inside the main function, right? So now I'm running the main function until the end. But as I'm running the main function, I may want to run something at the same time, another function which also executes its own instructions at the same time. So what I do in the main function, I create a thread, which is a call to another function. And I continue executing my main function. And at the same time, in another thread, the another function is executing the, its own instructions. And before this happens, I have to allocate memory for the thread, start the thread, and kind of assign the other function to the thread so it, it all happens, okay? In Go, it's very simple because I just prefix uh, my function with the uh, Go statement, and suddenly the two functions run concurrently. So if I have... Um, if I will have, uh, whoops, so if, I, if we go back, um, if I go to hello go again, and I will delete this functional things. So I will say I have a function f which does something. Okay, so there is a function f which does something, and there is a kind of a sequence of instruction that that function is doing. I will not be writing stuff, but imagine that there is uh, more to the function that I wrote. And then I have another function, g, which is also doing stuff, right? What will happen if I say here, if I say uh, f and g? Normally, what would happen is, Function main will start the process and the main thread. F will be called and then the control will go to the F function and start executing the F instructions until it's done. And then it will quit. It will reach that closing bracket. So it will quit and then it will go to G and it will start executing G, okay? Uh, if I say, if I do this, So for is like a for loop, uh, and then if I don't see any, if I don't say anything, it's a forever loop, right? So for means execute those instructions inside the loop forever. There is no exit condition, right? So what will happen now? Will G be executed? No, G will never be executed because I I got stuck at F. So F will kind of loop forever and never go to G. Okay. So if I want to do F forever, like for example, I want to be forever listening on a socket for incoming connections, but at the same time, I need to handle UI and so on, I would have to make F to run in its own thread. So in Go, you just do this. Now I started F in a separate thread and it will loop forever in this separate thread and I will, my normal main thread will continue to G and start executing G. And then it will wait until G finishes and then go here, okay? If the main thread finishes, if your main thread goes to the end and reaches the closing bracket and you're done, all the threads will be killed and closed as well, okay? So even though I said F will run forever, that's not strictly true because F will run for as long as G needs to run to finish and once G is done, F will be killed and the program will finish. So if you want to loop forever, 
to um, continue waiting for network connections or what you're doing inside F. And here you have to have some sort of a statement that blocks the execution until you really want to shut down, right? So you have to have some kind of condition saying, you know, wait here until this condition is false, and then if it's true, then then quit, and then everything will shut down, okay? Otherwise, if you don't have the, that extra statement before the end, your application will close down and your uh, running threads will be killed, okay? It's actually a bug if that happens. It's considered kind of a, a bad programming practice if I wrote this program here, and I finish G, and when I'm reaching the closing bracket, my F is still running. <coughs> because, like, if I'm shutting down the program, why, why is F still running? F should be shut down properly by the programmer, right? So at this point here, I should have F already shut down. If I don't, Go will tell you, well, you're doing probably something wrong because you still have this thread running, and you're finishing the main thread. So this error message will help you to properly tidy up and clean up all the threads to, uh, to shut down. So now, how would you shut down F when you're reaching that point and you really want to close? Well, you have to somehow communicate between the threads. I have to have a mechanism for communicating between the main thread, which is here, and the F thread which is doing um, the, the networking or whatever you're doing there, right? So to achieve that, there is a concept of a channel. A channel, think of, of a channel as a pipe. Um, so the pipe has two ends. You can put stuff from one end and somebody else can read it from the other end, right? Um, and the, the pipes, because the pipes have two ends, one is the incoming end, where you can put stuff in, and the other one is the outgoing end, where you can take stuff out. And in Go, it's kind of uh, uh, very simple, because you're doing it by, um, uh, by arrows. So if I have a channel C, which is... Um, um, let's say C is a string channel. I can put strings into that channel and read strings out of it, right? So if I want to put string into C, I say, um, oops, sorry. I say put uh, Marius into C. And if I want to read from C, so I want to read a string which is inside C, inside the pipe, inside the channel, I say read from C, okay? So I can read from a channel and I can write to a channel. Uh, and when you want to communicate with the thread which is running somewhere else, you need to pass the channel around. So what I would normally do, I would say, okay, F will... Um, F will accept a channel, which is a, a string channel, right? And actually, it is only possible for F to read from that channel. I can say C, in which case it means F can read and write from a channel, or I can say F cannot write to a channel, it can only read from a channel, okay? And then I can say... Um, for, um, I can say, um, so because we want to close F, passing a string is actually, um, I don't need to pass a string. I, I can pass a boolean, right? So I can say, I'm actually keen on getting a bool out of it. So I can say finished is, um, is false, and then while I'm still, um, yeah, so not finished, I will run that loop, and then when I'm finished, I will um, 
quit, but I need to read if somebody said true to the channel. So I have to say finished. I'm reading from from C. And then in here I would say make a boolean channel. And then when I'm about to close, I would say pass true to C. Okay? Does it make sense? There is a problem with this program. And the problem is that the reading and writing from channels is blocking. Right? So if there is nothing to read from a channel, uh, this line will block until there is something in the channel. And I don't want that because I want to be looping all the time, even if there is nothing in the channel, right? So there is a different uh, um, construct to achieve exactly that. It's called select. Um, so instead of doing that, I can say select and I have um, a case where there is um, default behavior is the behavior of the loop. So if there is nothing in the channel, then the normal loop will happen. So the normal logic that I had inside the loop will happen here, right? And then if in case where there is something in the channel, I want to get it. So I say finished equal, uh, actually I already defined it. Uh, I say finished uh, is, I'm reading from C. And then I say, um, I actually don't need to do anything because, you know, um, the I, I still need the loop though. So I still need to say for finished. I need the loop. So if I'm not finished, I'm looping and then um, the indentation is wrong. Yeah, I need something here. Let's say I'm um, doing nothing. So yeah, my indentation is a little bit broken because I'm closing this, closing that. All right. So when um when there is something in the channel, finish will get the value. If there is nothing in the channel, the default loop will happen. And then if there, is, if there was something in the, in the channel and I got the boolean true, then I will finish the, the loop, right? And the loop will quit because the condition will be fulfilled. Does it make sense? So now I can kind of quit the loop by pushing something into a channel. And you can kind of push, um, yeah, obviously that is not happening. And that is not happening either. So that's now the. To pass the channel to F though. Yes. So you need to pass C. You need to pass C to F. You can pass results, you can pass tracts around, you can pass numbers, you can pass booleans, you can pass whatever you want, right? So the only thing that ties now channels and functions and threads together is this passing of channels. So as long as there is a, a communication, then they can kind of communicate with each other. In fact, you can make G, uh, you can make G that G takes a input channel, which is bool, and G will pass, um, when G is called, G will pass uh, true to a channel. And then, in fact, you don't have to be doing that in the main thread. It can be happening in G, right? So now if I say G has a channel the same as F, and G is putting something in when it's ready, so 
you know, G is doing some computing here. So at the beginning, G is doing some computing. And then when G finishes, it says, okay, I'm done. And when G finishes, that closes the, the F, right? The parallel thing. So now I can have this happening concurrently. And then I have to wait here um, for a notification. So here I have to block until um, F tells me that F is done, right? So what I can do now, I can uh, have another channel for which the F communicates with me and tells me that, okay, G tells F that G was done, so F should, should finish. And when F finishes and get, reaches the closing bracket, it can communicate to the main, um, main statement. So that's all there is to concurrent programming. Uh, in Go. You have the Go and function call. You have the channels uh, with the arrows for input and output. And then you have the select statement. And that's it. So there is a short tutorial which I encourage you to, to check. Um, and that will be the concurrent programming. What's the difference between parallel programming and concurrent programming? What's the difference between parallel processing and concurrent processing? Any ideas? Any guesses? Is there a difference? Who thinks there is a difference? Who thinks that there is no difference? They are the same. Oh, come on, you, you have to choose one or two. There is no third option. <laughs> All right, so the difference is that um, semantically and from programmer point of view, there is no difference. Uh, if you're programming, then uh, you don't care because in your mind, they happen at the same time. They are kind of uh, happening like together in a sense, right? But Technically, parallel processing or parallel programming happens when two things are computed at, at the same time. So if you have a multi-core machine, let's say I have eight cores, I can have eight things happening at the same time because each core might be doing the same, I mean, not the same, but a particular computation independent of the other core, right? That's parallel. Concurrent means they appear as happening at the same time, but it's the operating system deciding who runs what. So if I have a single CPU, one core, I can only run one program at the time. I can only run one CPU instruction at the time. There is no parallel processing, right? Yet, I can run multiple programs on my Windows operating system, and they all seem to be running at the same time, concurrently, right? How it, how it happens? Well, you know, it happens by context switching. So I'm using the CPU and I.O. resources a little bit for this process, a little bit for this process, a little bit for this process, a little bit for that. And it appears as if they are running at the same time. But in fact, at every single time slice, only one thing runs. Okay? So concurrent means that parallelism is really simulated. It's not true. And parallel means they actually happen, you know, at particular time slice, two things happen at the same time. Okay? Uh, but from programming, you don't care. I mean, if you have a single CPU machine and you wrote this program, and if you have 256 core machine and you wrote this program, in your mind, it always happens like concurrently, right? So you don't know if it happens in parallel or not, but you don't care. You know they don't block each other. They kind of happening at the same time. I mean, not literally, but somewhat simulated. Okay, uh, what we have left? We're running a little bit low in time again. So we have a few things left. Um, come on, network. All right. Um, okay, so you have a pre-task. Um, so, so there is one task here, uh, again, for those of you who like homeworks. Um, do you know what sleep function does?
Yeah? It puts the program to sleep, so it's just post program. Exactly. So you can say sleep for 1000 and it will sleep for 1000 milliseconds. Let's assume the sleep takes milliseconds as a unit of time. Uh, so if I say sleep 1000, it will say, okay, it will kind of call sleep, wait one second and then continue, right? If I say sleep 10,000, it will go here, wait 10,000 seconds, I, I mean 10,000 milliseconds, 10 seconds and then continue. Uh, so write a sleep function in Go, which uses the time after uh, to block for a given duration of time and then continue. Okay? How would you do that? Well, you would use time after. Time after uh, sends an event, right? So you, would in, in, you will have a function which calls time after and waits for time after to send you back on a channel a notification that, you know, um, a particular event happened, and then you quit that function. So in your program, if you call sleep, it would appear to be waiting for a given duration of time until the time after kicks back, and then you would continue. It's really straightforward. You can probably do it like in three lines of code, uh, and you can check, um, you can check, um, the time package and it, it has examples of how to use it and then there is a, um, time after which returns a boolean um, and you can check you know how it works so if you if you know how to do it, you can post uh, on Blackboard your your code snippet. All right. So then there is a, a next um, a next next task was write a server application that handles the request for hello URL request, uh, and that app prints hello. We did that on the setup. Uh, lecture where we were setting up the Heroku and uh, Go Cloud, Google Cloud. There was a small program, uh, so you don't really need to write it, it's already written, you just need to modify it so it responds to that particular URL, right? So get this program back, see how it was responding to the slash, and now you just have to add hello to the slash and you, you have the A part solved, right? Modify the app so that it handles hello name and prints hello name, uh, where name is a parameter, right? How would you do that? How would you parameterize it? So it extracts the name out of the URL, and instead of printing hello world, it prints hello Marius if I say slash hello slash Marius, okay? Again, it's like two lines of code. Uh, you just need to check how you extract the parameter out of the request, and how you can extract that name out of the URL, okay? I will show it on in the next um, uh, ne on next Monday. Uh, we will kind of review that. JSON we've done. REST we've done a little bit, so um, we can discuss it on on Monday. Um, and then parsing parsing JSON we can discuss on Monday. So REST and parsing JSON you need for your assignment. So we will discuss it on uh, my Monday session. All right, questions? Okay, so that's it for today. We're finishing on time. <laughs>